Welcome to the AV Pro Edge 4K and HDR video distribution for 2019 webinar. My name is Jason Dustel. I am with AV Pro Edge, uh, currently in the warm, just kidding, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, we're going to have a really cool webinar today. We're going to talk about some uh, HDR and 18 gig video distribution, and we're going to look a little bit into the future and talk a little bit about HDMI 2.1 and 48 gigs and kind of some plans that we have to be able to move these high bandwidth signals around a distributed system. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the AV Pro Edge product and extenders and some of the products that we have coming. Uh, you guys will get a sneak peek at a brand new product that we have not released yet. So look forward to that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we do have a question box that you're uh, feel free to type some questions into if you have them. I do have Tom Devine here from the marketing team. He's also on the webinar. He's gonna be uh, filtering those questions for me. Um, in case there are some questions uh, that Tom's not able to get to and, and throughout the presentation, I will leave some time at the end for some Q&A. So if you have some questions, we're gonna do that. And if there are some questions that um, you have uh, for me specifically, you're always welcome to email me, jason at avproglobal.com, or you can always give us a call and talk to some of the tech support folks as well. So let's get started. Just a quick uh, note on AV Pro. If you're new to AV Pro, welcome. If you are, are continuing to use AV Pro products and you have in the past, thank you for uh, thank you for your support. We are AV Pro Global Holdings. Uh, we have a few brands that we uh, that we um, that are under our belt here. We've got AV Pro Edge, which is going to be our extender products and matrix switch products and things like our scalers and and all the the nice pieces of hardware we make for distribution. We also have the Meridio brand, which is going to be some HDMI test equipment. We have the Fox and the Hound test equipment kit. We have the Meridio 6A and 6G test kit, also used for calibration. Uh, we also have the video processor called the Prisma. So there's a few few cool products under the Meridio label. We also have Bullet Train HDMI cables. You guys are going to get a sneak peek today at some some of the stuff we're we're planning on for HDMI cables for the future. And then of course our control system, Canvas CSI. Um, we have a custom control system that takes all of the headache of programming out of the integrator's hands and, and leaves it to us. Uh, basically, we do all your programming for you. And so when you go to, uh, you know, tighten up and finalize the system at a client's home or in a restaurant or something like that, all the program is already done. And uh, you guys don't have to worry about those things. You just have to worry about teaching the customer how to use the, uh, how to use the system. It's pretty cool. Uh, this is me. My name is Jason. Uh, I do see some familiar names uh, on the attendee list for the webinar. So thank you guys for, for rejoining us for another one here. Um, I've been tinkering with AV my entire life. Some of my earliest memories are fixing tube stereos and radios with my grandfather. So I've been in this for a long time as an enthusiast. I started doing it professionally in 1999. So we're just about 20 years now. About 15 of those 20 years has been doing installation, running wires, mounting TVs, doing some of the things that you guys probably do every day. Um, for about 10 of these years, I've also done ISF calibration. I've been teaching ISF since 2012, and I became HDBase-T authorized uh, a couple years ago. And 2017 was a very proud moment of mine and proud moment for us at AV Pro. Um, I was nominated and won the Dealerscope 2017 40 Under 40 Award. And I also contribute to the CTA Working Group R10WG3, which is Home Theater Best Practices. So just a little bit about me. We'll do a quick company over, overview with AV Pro Global. We've been around since 2011. We started off as an online sales channel, uh, but we couldn't stop there. We, we had a, a mission to make products for the integrators, not just sell products. Uh, so when you see some of our products like AV Pro Edge matrix switches and extenders and things like that, these are products that we developed specifically for you guys based off of your feedback. So, you know, part of our mission and our goal is to, to make it as easy for you guys as possible out in the field dealing with these, you know, typically, you know, complex systems, especially with HDR and 4K and 18 gigs. Uh, so we're here for you guys. Uh, we just want to make a simple product that just works and, and has a great warranty. Uh, most of our products have... Um, like the Fox and Hound test kit and the Meridio products. We have a three-year warranty for a lot of AV Pro Edge products. We have a 10-year warranty. And really at the end of the day, guys, you know, we want to be here for you. And when things like HDMI 2.1 come, and we already saw some of that stuff at CES, uh, we, we don't want you guys to be running around like you're, you know, uh, confused and, and not sure how to handle these things. And, you know, we want to be here for you. So that's our job. Our job is to make products that are easy to use and, and, and work and uh, we want to be here for you in case you do have questions when you're installing our product. So before we get too deep into it, I just want to do like a quick uh, run through on 4K and HDR and what it's all about and kind of teach you a little bit about some of the specs and, and what some of the numbers mean. 
um, and uh, we'll clear up some of these uh, maybe things that might be confusing to you now. So uh, first off, we need to talk about picture quality and why HDR is so important. So, you know, uh, especially here at AV Pro, we, we do have a rich history with the with the ISF and we we definitely understand picture quality and, and, and these are some of the things that we look for when we're judging picture quality. So the number one thing that we are always looking for is dynamic range. Um, and simply put, dynamic range is the difference between the brightest part of the picture and the darkest part of the picture. And we want there to be a very big difference. And at the same time, we also want to see all the details there as well. So, you know, it, it doesn't help the picture at all if you have really, really, really good black levels, but they're so low that you can't see shadows in dark movies. Same thing on the other side of the spectrum. You know, maybe you have a TV that can get really, really, really bright, but um, you're losing detail in, in bright parts of the picture too, such as like... Uh, uh, if you're watching like Planet Earth 2 or something and you put on the episode about Antarctica, we want to see all the detail in the snow and the polar bears and that kind of thing too. Dynamic range is always going to be the most important because that's how our eyes work. Uh, if you guys, a uh, couple YouTube videos that you can check out and next time you go to the eye doctor, talk to the eye doctor about the rods and the cones. Um, our rods pick up dark to bright information. Our cones pick up color information. These are the sensors that we have in our eyes and we happen to have way more rods than cones. So when we talk about dynamic range, it's very, very important. So seeing high dynamic range now is making a massive, massive improvement to the picture quality. After dynamic range is more color, color saturation. One of the great things about HDR and 18 gigs is we can support wider color gamuts and we'll get into color gamuts in a little bit as well. Uh, we are looking at something like 64 billion colors uh, here pretty soon with, with these super wide color gamuts and, and high bit depths. Uh, after more color, we want accurate color, we want better color, meaning that we want less noise, less, co uh, less color banding, more accurate color, uh, and things like that. Last on the least is going to be resolution. Um, overall, how clear is the picture, how noisy is the picture. Um, resolution is a funny thing because that's what we hear most from the TV manufacturers and the marketing teams that work with those folks. But at the end of the day, resolution, as important as it is, it's not as important as the other things. But the nice thing is, is when we see these new specs for HDMI 2.1 and things like that, we're going to be getting into some really high resolutions. We're going to be getting into, uh, we're dealing with 4K now, of course, which is giving us some nice, big, clear images. Uh, we can do some nice, big screens, but the future is going to be 5K, uh, even 8K. We saw some 8K displays at CES, and uh, the spec actually allows room for 10K. So we could be dealing with some really, really, really high res uh, signals here really quickly. Uh, one thing that you don't see on this list right now is motion. Um, We've been dealing with 24 frames per second for a long, long time, the history of film. We've been dealing with 30 frames per second with television and things like that. We are seeing some video games that are 60 frames per second. Uh, there is one Hollywood movie called Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk that is 60 frames per second natively on the disc. It looks really cool. Um, and then we're getting into 120 frames per second, which we don't really have right now in too many things, but... I see that would be, I have a feeling that I'm going to see that being a very big deal when it comes to video games and, and really especially sports. So the higher the frame rate typically equates to the smooth, uh, a smoother picture. So when you're watching, you know, a football player running down the field, he's not all jerky and things like that. you got nice smooth motion. And that eats, eats up a lot of bandwidth too. So when we're looking at some bandwidth uh, charts a little bit later in the presentation, uh, we'll get an idea of how much bandwidth uh, 120 frames per second actually takes up. And it's a lot. So we got to be ready for it because it's coming. So we already talked a little bit about dynamic range being, you know, the brightest to the darkest part of the picture. Um, with HDR, we're getting much, much, much more information. Um, we're trying to get closer to mimicking human vision as close as we can. Uh, on a nice sunny day, you, you might go outside and be dealing with anywhere from zero to 100,000 nits. That could be uh, like right now in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, there's uh, some fresh snow on the ground and the sun shines off of it. and It's very, very bright. So you might be pushing 100, 120,000 nits. Uh, and something where it's completely black might be zero nits. So we have a very, very, very big range that we see in real life. And we're starting to get closer and closer to that in, in video as well. We've traditionally been dealing with 100 nits in standard dynamic range. And in high dynamic range, depending on the, the movie or the type of high dynamic range, we could be dealing with as much as 10,000 nits. So we're starting to see more and more, uh, more detail in bright, dark, bright and dark parts of the picture. We're starting to see more steps. We're starting to get higher bit depths, getting less banding, things like that. And really at the end of the day, day guys, is we're trying to get closer and closer and closer to human vision. Uh, this graph that you're looking at here is a typical CIE chart. Uh, this is what we use a lot in calibration, but it's a very good explanation for color gamuts. So let me get my laser pointer here. And 
if we go around the outer edge of the CIE chart, this is human vision. These are all the colors that we can see as humans. Now, inside of the triangle, you'll have smaller triangles, and those represent the different color gamuts that we deal with in video. So we have all of this color that we can see in real life. But if we look at this inside dotted line, that is Rec. 709. This is the color space that we've been dealing with since the 1990s. And it's been great. But look at how little of the color gamut it actually covers. And it, for those of you who've seen really good Blu-ray calibrated and, and on a really good display in a nice dark room, you might see some really great colors on Rec. 709. And there's several DVDs, uh, I'm sorry, several Blu-rays that I own that have great color and they're only Rec. 709. Uh, but, you know, we're, as we're looking uh, into the future and, and we're going to be able to handle more bandwidth and stuff, we want more color. So this is kind of the equivalent of maybe the eight pack of Crayola crayons that you might buy, um, you know, you might buy for, for school, for your kids or something. And we want more colors than that. We want more crayons. So we go with bigger color gamuts. Like the next one that you see with this dotted line is called P3. That's what we're seeing in the theater pretty much. It's called DCI when you're talking about it in a theater environment. On a TV at home, we're talking about P3 color. Um, now you don't gain much blue. If you look down here at the bottom, there's not a lot of extra blue. There is a little bit more extra red, but look at how much more green you get when you go from 709 to P3. That becomes important because our eyes as humans, we're way more sensitive to green than we are to red and blue. So getting more green is also going to get us more luminance. It's going to help with the whole HDR thing. And, um, you know, if you think about things like, uh, there was a specific episode of Blue Planet 2 that I remember watching where um, there were some researchers out on a research boat and they all had to wear those like safety vests uh, that were like lime green, those lime green safety vests. You guys have probably seen those before. Um, you know, being able to have this much more yellow and this much more green, those safety vests looked more like they do in real life. So we're gonna gain a lot of green here. We're gonna get a lot, um, you know, a lot deeper greens and brighter greens and things like that. It's really important to our vision. At the end of the day, what we're really aiming for guys at, at the end of it all is Rec 2020. And that's this big triangle right here. If you compare 709 to 2020 or even P3 to 2020, you do get you do get a bit more red. Um, you'll finally actually be able to see Coca-Cola red properly on a TV when we deal with 2020. Uh, blue, we're not as sensitive to blue, so you gain a little bit with 2020, but not much. But way, way, way more green with Rec 2020. Now, this is something that we're already seeing support for. Uh, we already have some movies that are mastered at Rec 2020. Uh, we already have displays that can accept that high bandwidth signal and accept Rec 2020. The only thing that we're dealing with right now is that we don't have any displays that can actually show Rec 2020. So we're kind of preparing ourselves for the future here with Rec 2020, but it's coming. Uh, we will eventually have some displays. I do remember specifically a Hisense display at uh, CES that claimed to be 97% of Rec 2020 at 4,000 nits. So, um, you know, we're, we're starting to see these things come to fruition, and I'm really excited to see it myself. I mean, the the, the more dynamic range, the better. The, the more color, the better. And I just can't wait to go back and rewatch some old films and old movies and old TV shows and these really wide color gamuts because it's going to be like watching the movie all over again. It's almost like the same thing with audio. When you get a, your first nice pair of speakers or a nice set of headphones, you end up going back and listening to all your old albums and CDs because you start hearing things you couldn't hear before. So I have a feeling this is going to happen in video too. So we'll take an example like Blade Runner 2049, which is mastered at 10,000 nits with Rec 2020 color. If I have a TV right now that's only P3 color and 800 nits, like my LG OLED at home, I still haven't seen that movie in its full glory. So we're kind of in a weird period right now where we're waiting for the devices and the, and the displays to catch up with the content. So really looking forward to that now. Should be really cool in the future. So uh, we talked a little bit about better color and higher bit depths. We mentioned that a little bit before. Uh, we've traditionally been dealing with an 8-bit video system, which gives us 256 steps from bright to dark. 10-bit, that gives us a little bit more. And 12-bit gets, gets us even more than that. So we go from 256 steps to 1,024 to 4,096. And the really big benefit is with more bit depth and, and more bits is you have these smooth gradations from dark to bright. And a lot of times you'll see this in movies too. A good example I can think of right now is The Martian, where at the very beginning, the sky is very orange. And if you look really close, if the TV is not set up properly or we're not giving it uh, 10 bits, uh, if you do it in 8-bit, you do have a lot of banding in the sky. You see it a lot on planet Earth and blue planet and like when they're underwater in the ocean or they're looking uh, up at things in the sky, you have all this color banding in the sky and it's distracting and it, and it hurts the picture. So one great benefit about HDR is that you have more bits, more information, less color banding, smoother transitions. And just overall a better picture, a nicer picture. 
Couple things we'll talk about quickly here with RGB triplets. Um, this is how TVs make color. Uh, most TVs in a traditional sense, if you take a magnifying glass and you put up a white screen um, on your television and, and look at it through the magnifying glass, you have three sub-pixels for each pixel, red, green, and blue. So each one of those will get a numerical value for, for how much information or how much light it's putting out. So for example, if we're looking at a normal 8-bit system that's full range, uncompressed, that's 0 to 255. So if we look at a triplet that uh, for, for a pure white signal, the red value is 255, the green value is 255, the blue value is 255, meaning we have 255 steps from dark to bright. Now, when we go into 10-bit, that goes to 1,024. So black is still black and white is still white, but instead of having 250 plus steps in between, we're not going to be dealing with 1,000 steps in between. So smoother gradations and, and all that great stuff we talked about before. In 12-bit, it's going to be even bigger. We're talking about 4,096 steps at this point. So really, really, really good, clean, smooth transitions in color. One thing I do want to point out here, because there is some confusion around this, when we talk about 8 bits in a full RGB system, that's the full 0 to 255. What we deal with in video, though, is slightly compressed. We deal with 16 to 235. So full range would be RGB, and if you were hooking up a desktop computer to a computer monitor, it's okay to go full range. It's okay to go RGB. That much bandwidth is not a big deal because typically you have a desktop computer hooked up to a monitor with a three or four foot cable, and it's all right there. So that's okay. But when we talk about video, we talk about Blu-ray discs and broadcast television, that, com that, that signal is compressed a bit. So instead of getting the full 0 to 255, you end up getting 16 to 235. So you lose a little bit of, of steps in the, in the darkest part of the picture and the brightest part of the picture. Luckily, a lot of displays still will show over level 235. We have a lot of that going on right now. But as you can see, I just wanted to point out to you guys, here's how these numbers work and here's what they all mean. And ultimately, we're going to be aiming for 12-bit and maybe even 16-bit one day. I haven't seen a spec for that yet, but um, then we're dealing with you know thousands and thousands of more steps and billions and millions of more colors. So it's coming. Number four, as we talked about before, was resolution. This is the thing that most people think determines picture quality and defines picture quality. And for you guys who've been doing this for a while, you, you already understand that um, resolution, as important as it, as it is, it's not the most important part to the picture. But with resolution overall, what we're looking for here is clarity. Uh, we want the picture to be nice and sharp and nice and clear. Uh, we've been dealing with, you know, m most of us have been dealing with um, eight, you know, normal HD, 1080p now for quite a while. Uh, we've seen some 4K stuff now for a few years. We've got 8K stuff coming, 5K stuff coming, 10K stuff coming. And that's going to allow us to go not only bigger with the display, but that's also going to let us sit closer too for a more immersive, uh, more immersive experience. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people kind of harp on 8K and 10K and even 4K and say it's not necessary, you know? And there is some truth to that. You know, if we're looking at a 32 inch TV or, or a computer monitor and we're sitting a decent amount away, a decent distance away at least. Sure, 8K might be overkill on a 32 inch or 42 inch monitor or something like that. But when we're seeing displays at CES in the 80, 90, 100 inch range, and people wanna sit nice and close to those to be fully immersed, then absolutely 10K, 8K, 5K, that all becomes very important. For those of you who were at CES or at least saw the news, we saw a 219 inch Samsung micro LED wall. We saw a big 14 foot wide Sony crystal LED wall. We saw a Sony 90-inch TV. We saw a bunch of 88-inch OLEDs. Uh, when we start talking about those really big screens, guys, then 8K, of course, makes sense, and 10K, of course, makes sense. So the bigger we want to go, the closer we want to sit, that's where resolution really matters. And at that point, you know, the more the merrier. Okay, so now that we know a little bit more about dynamic range and color gamuts and things like that, we want to kind of uh, transition that into bandwidth. Um, this stuff takes a lot of bandwidth to push around, and it's difficult for HDMI cables to handle it. It's difficult for some sources to output it. It's difficult for some displays to handle it. So there's a couple things we'll talk about in regards to bandwidth and hope, hopefully help you understand some of the numbers and what it all means. Um, at the end of the day, it's just you know upgrading these four things for a better picture. It's just sending more data around the video signal and around the distribution system. We've got to be able to handle those signals without losing the picture or, or, or artifacting the picture and, and color banding and excess noise and things like that. We want a nice clean picture at the end of the day that's also stable. Um, i sure you guys have probably dealt with, especially with 18 gigs in the past couple of years, you guys have probably already dealt with your own headaches 
when you're talking to clients and they're saying things like, oh, the picture cuts in and out and stuff like that. Um, so it, it is difficult. We will we'll look at some of the numbers and you can kind of see how, how this all works. So uh, this chart's one of my favorites. This can be found on the Meridio and the AV Pro Edge uh, websites. Uh, this chart gives us an idea of, well, this resolution at this frame rate with this chroma, uh, with this bit depth, with or without HDR, gets us this much bandwidth or, or costs this much bandwidth. So if you re rewind the clock all the way back to about 2003 or four, we look at some of the first early versions of HDMI. You know, if we were doing a 1920 by 1080 signal at 24 frames per second with 422 color at eight bits with no HDR and no wide color gamut, we were barely under a gig. And at the time I remember hearing things about 10 gigs and thinking like, wow, that 10 gigs is a lot. But you know, as the years progress and as the systems evolved, we got to 10 gigs pretty quick. Um, when we go down here to like say 4K 60, I'm sorry, 4K 24, 422 color at 12 bits with HDR, we're pushing about 11 gigs. But again, right now the spec calls for 18. So 18 gigs, uh, we're already pushing that limit. I mentioned before that Billy Lynn long halftime walk movie. When you look at that movie and you look at the you look at the specs on an analyzer, it's 4K 60, so uh, 4K resolution, 60 frames per second. By the way, that is natively 60 frames per second. It's not upscaled motion. It actually looks kind of cool. I encourage you to check it out if you can. Uh, that's with uncompressed color at 444 and 8 bits. Uh, now, you might be saying, why not 10 bits? Well, to get the 4K, to get the 60, and to get the uncompressed color, if we did that at 10 bits, that puts us over 18 gigs. That puts us at around 22 22 and a half gigs or so. So that Billy Lynn movie at 4K, 60, 444, 8-bit with HDR, with wide color, that puts us right at 17.8 gigs. And guys, that's only one movie. There's only one movie that takes up that much um, bandwidth right now. And I can only expect that in the, you know, in the coming you know, months, days, years, we're gonna have more and more and more. And we're already at 17.8 gigs. We're already pushing the limit. Now, if I did want to get a higher bit depth, I could go to 12 bits, but I'm going to take a little bit of a sacrifice on the color here. So I, if, if we wanted to go 12 bits instead, we might not have good of, as good of color as we could as if we were dealing with 8 bits. So the, the general rule of thumb here, guys, is something has to give. We can't have everything that we want in a 18 gig system. We, we need more. We need more bandwidth. So again, currently we're at HDMI 2.0, which is 18 gigs. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later in the presentation about some of the, uh, some of the things that we've had success with, with distribution, uh, with HDMI 2.1, that's going to allow us to not only get higher resolutions, but like we looked at before, more color, uh, more bit depths and things like that, but it is going to cost bandwidth and we're going to be aiming for 48 gigs. Here's a couple graphs from Cedia that kind of show us how much bandwidth this stuff actually eats up and takes. Uh, when we go back to some 1080p stuff, uh, let's say if we're going to be 1080p, 30 frames per second, 8 bits, 444 color, we're only dealing with about 9 gigs, guys. That's not a lot, you know, but that's also 1080p. We want more than that. When we look at 4K, let's say we wanted to do 4K 60, 10 bit with 444 color, you know, now you're talking 20 gigs. So we're already past the, uh, past the allotment. Um, now, we're going to still be able to do a lot of 4K stuff within 48 gigs. We're still going to be, be able to do quite a bit of it, actually. So if we look at like the biggest spec right now for 4K, for bandwidth at least, we've got 4K, 120 frames per second, 10-bit, 444 color. That puts us at 40 gigs. That's not going to work for 18. 18, we're going to be somewhere down here. So 4K, 8 bits. Uh, I'm sorry, 4K, 120, 8 bits with 420 color. We're at 16. So again, we had to sacrifice color going down to 420. We had to sacrifice some, some bit depth and going down to eight. So at the end of the day, guys, something has to give. We, we need more bandwidth, and that's what HDMI 2.1 is going to really help with. Now, we look at higher resolutions in 4K. We get into 5K. If we want to do a TV show, for example, at 5K, 30 frames per second, 10 bits, 444, that puts us at about 13 gigs. That's not that big of a deal. But when we want to up the frame rate, that's when things can get squirrely. We go 5K 60, maybe 10 bits at 444 color, for example. Now we're talking over 20 gigs. That's not going to work in the current system. That's what we need um, HDMI 2.1 for. 5K is going to be an interesting resolution. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be pretty popular with video games. What I'm not 100% sure about is how it's going to uh, be with film. I think we're going to be able to do some higher aspect or, or wider aspect ratios that 
at native resolution. That sounds really cool. Um, I have seen some native 5K cameras. I think there's a red cam um, that does 5K natively, but if we looked at 5K at 120, 12 bits, 444, that's not even gonna make the HDMI 2.1 spec. That's gonna be 60 gigs. So you guys get a snapshot here of just how much bandwidth all this stuff takes, and it's quite a bit. And this is only 5K. We jump into 10K and 8K, uh, which this is what the new spec calls for, uh, up to 10K. Some of the 8K displays we saw at CES, if we took an example like this, 8K, 60 frames per second, 10 bits, 420 color, 40 gigs. No big deal. That'll work well with HDMI 2.1. Where it's going to fall apart is if we want to go 8K, 60, 12 gigs, we even after knocking the chroma down to 422, we're still 64 gigs. That's still over the 48 gig spec. So even at 8K, we're going to have a lot of, um, we're going to have a lot of things that we have to sacrifice with 8K if we want the really high frame rates. Uh, 8K, 120, for example, if we go 8K, 120, 10 bits, 444 color, that's 160 gigs, guys. That's a lot. It's a lot. So we're going to be dealing with some of this stuff in the future for sure. Uh, until we have unlimited bandwidth, which is probably a, some sort of utopian AV society. Uh, don't see it happening anytime soon. 10K, things get even worse for bandwidth. 10K, 60 at 10 bits, 444 colors, 100 gigs. Uh, we're going to need a, a higher version of HDMI and even more bandwidth to do those types of things in the future. Uh, if we really look at it and max it out, 10K, 120 frames per second at 12 bits with uncompressed color, 240 gigs. So to see something like that, we're going to need way more bandwidth than what we're dealing with now, way more bandwidth than what we're dealing with HDMI 2.1. Now, luckily with 10K, there are still some formats and some combinations here that will still fit within, um, within HDMI 2.1. So if we take this, for example, 10K, 30 frames per second, maybe it's a TV show, or 20 frames per second, maybe it's a movie, and we do that at 10 bits, we can squish the color a little bit down to 420, and that puts us at 25 gigs. Not bad. We can go up as high as 12 bits at 422 and still be at 40 gigs and still be within the HDMI 2.1 spec. So we are going to see some really cool things uh, really quickly here in the, in the next year or two, I think. But um, you know, at the end of the day, guys, we're just going to continue to evolve and, and, and need more and more bandwidth over time. Uh, and we'll be here. We'll be here to do that. We'll be here to figure all this out for you. Um, you know, We have plans for our products to be able to support these things. Um, We'll look at one of the uh, we'll look at one of the plans we have for the um, there's a new generator coming the Meridio 7G. Uh, we'll we'll take a look at that a little bit later too and talk about what we're, what our plans are for that. So quick look at HDMI 2.1 bandwidth. Um, you know, 60 frames per second so it's a is a really uh, easy. You know, works out with the math and it's really easy to to move around a distribution system. We just don't have a lot of content at 60 frames per second yet. But when we look at something like 4K 60. 8 bits, 444, boom, we're still within HDMI 2.0. That's no problem. But anything after that, that's when we start running into issues. So if I wanted to go 8 bit to 10, like in that Billy Lynn movie, uh, that puts us over the speed limit already. That's 22. Uh, we start looking at uh, 4096 by 2160, which is a slightly wider aspect ratio, also 60 frames per second, 8 bits. We're still okay at 17.8 gigs. But as soon as we want to get into 10 bit or 12 bit, that's when we need HDMI 2.1. Again, 5K, 60, 8-bit, even at 8 bits, we're not going to be able to do 5K, 60. If we look at 8K, 60 at 8 bits, 444 color, that's 71 gigs. And we go to 10K, 60, 8-bit, we're talking about 90 gigs now. So again, as we want better pictures and bigger images and more color and things like that, we're just going to need more bandwidth. So great, we know a little bit more about 4K, we know a little bit more about HDR, and how are we planning on working with it? So we'll go over a couple of products now that help you with these type of situations. Um, you know, there are some challenges with 4K and HDR distribution. One of them is managing heat. Uh, if you guys have ever used a, a, a 18 gig extender before, you do notice they do get a little warm. Uh, we, do have, we do have a pro tip for you to help uh, deal with thermal management, we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, increased bandwidth, of course. We just looked at what, what some of these bandwidth requirements are. Also, increased distances. The longer the transmission is, the longer the HDMI cable especially, the more difficult it is to pass around those signals. So we have things like extenders that support 18 gigs to help with those situations. Also, too, guys, don't forget about HDCP. Don't forget about copyright protection. That's not going anywhere. Uh, this is something that's implemented by some of the manufacturers and, and Hollywood themselves. They don't want people copying their movies, and I get it. 
so we have to make sure that we're, we're uh, keeping that in mind too. The most current version of HTCP is 2.2, but sometimes you will have some legacy devices. Maybe it's an old AVR, an old Blu-ray player. That's only HTCP 1.4. So we need to be making products for you guys that support both so you don't have problems uh, when you're installing the system. Again, extra bandwidth brings more heat. Um, we, we'd have to be careful with, with how warm these extenders get. They, they, they were built to military grade spec and they can handle a lot of heat, but if you start stacking them on top of each other in a rack or things like that, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. Uh, at 1080p, we were only dealing with about four gigs worth of bandwidth. 4K is up to 18. So again, more bandwidth, more requirements, more difficult to move those signals around. Uh, 5K, 8K, 10K, as we just mentioned, that's up to about 48 gigs. And then we'll be looking at something after HDMI 2.1 at, at some point. So as a manufacturer for us, we have to think about things like larger heat sinks, uh, different chipsets that, that are maybe more powerful and more efficient at the same time. And then the, uh, we, we do have a rack solution for you too to help with this. We'll go over a little bit later. Distance, this is a big one. Um, I've seen HDMI cables in the past, even at 1080p fail. Uh, maybe it's 25 feet long, 30 feet long. That's about the longest I ever, ever, ever deal with, with uh, traditional copper HDMI cables. I try to keep it 15 feet or shorter, but you know, sometimes you have to go 20, 25 feet. Um, but after that, it, it gets really, really hard for that cable to handle that, that type of signal, even though it's only 1080p. And with 48 gigs, it's only going to be even worse. It's even harder with 18 gigs. With 18 gigs, we try not to use cables that are more than three or four meters. With 48 gigs, the, the recommendation so far that we've seen is that you don't use any passive copper HDMI cables that are longer than six feet or, or two meters. Um, there are other solutions though. If you're dealing with distance problems, you do have copper-based solutions like HD base T, meaning that you can run a category cable uh, throughout the home and, and still get uh, video distribution with 4K and HDR. Uh, keep in mind, anytime you're doing, dealing with HD base T and category cable, that does top out at 10.2 gigs. So we've got to figure out a clever way to be able to get the 18 gig data down the 10.2 gig pipeline. We'll go over some of that too here. Now, one thing that we've been playing with lately and it's been very successful for us is fiber. Um, we're using fiber now for extenders. We have a brand new extender that we'll talk about later in the presentation that passes purely uncompressed signal. Um, fiber has just a, a, a much, much more bandwidth. Uh, it can go much longer distances. Uh, another great thing about fiber is you don't have to worry about uh, interference from other things like Romex cable and AC handlers and refrigerators and microwaves and things like that. You know, fiber is passing pulses of lights, not electrons. So, so you don't have to worry about uh, electromagnetic interference. And again, the, the other benefits are great too, longer distances and that type of thing. We've been using copper cables in the past. It's been working out really well. But uh, once we get into these HDMI 2.1 48 gig signals, it's we have a hard time being able to, to pass that down copper, even if we compress it. So looking into the future, um, a lot of integrators are starting to get into fiber. We're teaching fiber in our, in our classes that we do. Uh, we talk about fiber in the ISF class just because it is going to be a much better solution going into the future. Uh, one thing that's a big benefit now that wasn't previous in previous years is fiber is now easily terminated in, on the job site or, or in the field. For people who have seen fiber being terminated in the field, um, it's, it's, it's not dangerous like it used to be. You don't have to worry about the, the glass breaking off and getting into your skin. Um, the fiber that we use by a company called Clearline, um, it has a, a protective polymer over it, and you can terminate this with a very, very affordable kit right there on the field. Uh, I've seen people that are really good at it before do it in less than a minute. And because of all these great things with the extra bandwidth and the longer distances and that type of thing, when we start looking at, you know, 48 gigs and more, uh, fiber is probably going to be the answer going forward. And it is somewhat future resistant. We covered this a little bit ago, but I just wanted to run through it one more time and, and get it on the slides for you. But um, some of the benefits of using fiber other than what we've already talked about is no need for compression. Uh, like I mentioned before, we do have a uncompressed fiber extender that's coming. Uh, we'll show you a picture of it here in a few slides. Much longer distances than running passive HDMI cables or even category cable. Um, I know I talk to a lot of integrators who are more on the commercial side. And if you're going to be wiring up, say, a you know high school football stadium or something like that, then some of the distances, uh, some of the requirements are, are very demanding. 
uh, we are one fiber, just one of our fiber extenders um, can go as far as uh, 2000 meters. So distance uh, becomes kind of a non-issue when you're using fiber. Uh, no electromagnetic magnetic interference. We already mentioned that before. And um, again, more, more bandwidth for uh, future proofing. I'm not really sure how much I like future proofing because we just don't know, but at least future resistive. Few more words on HCCP. Again, the most current version is 2.2. We see that on Blu-rays. We see that streaming from Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu. Anything that's 4K at this point is always going to be HCCP 2.2. Um, again, I don't know if the HCCP is going to get an update. I haven't haven't come across that information yet for HDMI 2.1, but right now we're dealing with 2.2. Um, and every part of the distribution system needs to be able to handle 2.2 and 1.4 because you again you may have some legacy devices. Uh, in that distributed system. So we need to be able to handle both. So in order to impl uh, implement 4K into a system, um, you know, it's not just about extending the signal. There's a lot more stuff that we want to make sure that you guys have your um, have access to, like uh, good processing for better pictures and less banding and less noise and things like that. We also want to give you guys an opportunity uh, for scaling. And we put scalers into a lot of our products because you might have a distributed system where seven out of eight TVs are 4K and one TV is 1080p. So we want we want, to, we want you guys to be able to scale that signal down for that one TV so you don't have to scale the whole system down for that one TV. Um, also for extension, we just talked about that a moment ago. Um, again, longer distances with HDMI, that gets very demanding. So we need to be able to offer you guys extenders that can handle all this stuff. Same thing with switchers as well. Um, troubleshooting tools for 4K. 4K is a little bit more difficult to troubleshoot than 1080p was just because there's so much more stuff to worry about. Uh, different versions of HDR, you have to be able to understand all that and decode it all and know what it all means. So being able to troubleshoot 4K is something that we really take seriously. And EDID management, very, very important in, in today's world, especially when we're dealing with systems that have a mix of 1080p and 4K. Uh, we need to be able to do some EDID management so um, so we can make everything happy and make everything work. And a lot of our products do have EDID management built in. So we'll look at a few solutions on how to actually distribute the full bandwidth 4K signal. Um, today's installations, you're not going to see HDMI 2.1. We saw it at CES. The manufacturers, most of them promised us that it was real 2.1. Uh, what we did see in 2018 uh, we did see some products that got some updates, and some of those updates were part of HDMI 2.1, like eARC, for example. Um, but in order to be fully 2.1 compliant, according to the, HD, uh, the HDMI.org folks, uh, in order to put that HDMI 2.1 sticker on your box, it has to be able to support all the features of, of HDMI 2.1. So you might have some features that trickle down to some older products, uh, but you're not going to see HDMI full-blown 2.1 until until this year. Uh, and the manufacturers at CES all told us that that they will have a product, uh, 2.1 product. Some of them I was actually surprised to hear that all four inputs were going to be HDMI 2.1. So that'll be interesting to see as soon as we get it. But we haven't gotten our hands on it yet, but it's coming. Not all products are built for 18 gigs. Sometimes you'll see products that say 4K. 4K does not mean 18 gigs. Um, if you have a product that supports 4K30, for example, that's not going to be the full 18 gigs. So we're looking at things like 4K, 60 frames per second, uh, 444 color, um, at least 10 bits, uh, and that's where we start pushing that 4K, I'm sorry, that um, that 18 gig uh, bandwidth. Um, and we have a full line of solutions for this stuff for you guys. Our matrix switches are all 18 gigs. Uh, I'm sorry, we, we have a line of them that are all 18 gigs. We have a line of extenders that are all 18 gig. We have a line of distribution amplifiers and HDMI splitters that are all 18 gig capable. And then of course, all of our testing and troubleshooting products like the Fox and the Hound and the 6A and 6G, uh, those are also gonna be 18 gig capable as well. So a couple different ways to extend a full bandwidth signal. Uh, way number one would be a, a longer, what we call an AOC HDMI cable. That's an active optical cable. Um, the cable itself is a blend of, of fiber and copper. So when you look at that cable, the TMDS channels in the cable, the ones that are carrying all of the really important information, like you know all the audio and all the video, that stuff's going to travel down the fiber part of the cable, whereas stuff like CEC and HTCP will still travel down the copper part of the cable. So that'll give us longer distances and, and, and things like that as well. So uh, your next option is a fiber extender. 
Um, we'll take a look at uh, just a uh, example of what that looks like here. So we've got a 4K source with 18 gigs, HDMI cable into a transmitter. Now coming out of here, we're going to be using fiber or category cable. You can do that. You can do the extensions two different ways. And then coming out from the other end, we go back to HDMI back into the display. So if we're using uh, if we're using the extenders and, and matrix switches that support uh, the 18 the full 18 gigs, what comes out of here and what ends up on the display is going to be exactly the same. Now, one thing that we do have to do, and you do have to keep this in mind, especially with HD based T based products, there has to be some compression that happens because they top out at 10.2 gigs, and we're talking 18. So you do have to compress the signal, and compression in the past has always been this really dirty word. Nobody ever wants to compress. Uh, I remember listening to my first MP3 and thinking like, oh my gosh, this sounds terrible, you know, and compression's always been kind of this dirty word. But there are ways to compress the signal without messing with the fidelity and the picture quality. So we have a proprietary technology called ICT, Invisible Compression Technology. Uh, for somebody like me who's done this for a long time and has a very, very particular picky eye, um, I see something that's going through a, a, a extender kit that has ICT, and I have a really, really, really hard time telling the difference. We set this demo up at CEDIA in 2018 in San Diego, where we set up a handful of displays. I think there was three of them. And one of them was being compressed, and the other two were not. And we were asking people as they visited the booth, which ones look, out of the three, which ones look the best, which ones, maybe if they notice any artifacts, maybe one looked worse than the other two, or, or we were just asking what people's opinions were of the picture. And we had people coming in really up close to the screen and really trying to pick it apart, really trying to be critical about it. And most people, uh, in fact, almost everybody uh, said that they couldn't see a difference between the ICT compression and having a straight HDMI cable plugged in. So rest assured, if you're using products with ICT, where it's not going to screw up the picture and it's still going to look really good. So again, we have to compress. There's no way around it. And compression in its simplest explanation, in its simplest form, is taking a large amount of data compressing it or shrinking it down to a smaller amount of data, which then becomes easier to distribute around the HDMI cables and around the infrastructure in the system. There is a cap of 10.2 gigs with, uh, with category cable, so we do have to compress 18 down to 10.2. Um, and the ICT helps with that a lot. Uh, again, uh, you, you have a nearly perfect picture. Uh, again, you have to be extremely picky and know exactly what you're looking for to even tell a difference. And when we hook up things like analyzers to, to actually look at the signal itself, even the analyzers can't see a difference. We still get we still get everything in its full glory. So don't worry about compression artifacts with ICT. Um, you will see the ICT logo on the product itself, itself if it does support it. So uh, if you're using any HD based T products, uh, make sure they have that ICT logo on them. Uh, and, and most, if not all of it nowadays will. Our HD base T products are really easy to to, uh, to pick out because there's HD base T in the model number. We'll look at a couple of those here in the next few slides. Okay, here's a couple of ICT options that we have. These are products that are HD base T with the invisible compression technology built in. So the bottom left here, you see a um, an HD base T based matrix switch. Uh, that comes in uh, 8 by 8 and a 4 by 4 and there's a bigger one coming that we're going to look at in a few slides. It's going to be a 16 by 16. You can use outputs from HD base T or you can use outputs from HDMI. So just keep in mind that those are going to mirror each other. Um, we do build in scalers specifically to this product for, uh, for the specific reason of you might not have all 4K displays in your system. Maybe you have some 1080p displays. So all your scaling can be done at the switch and you don't have to buy an external scaler like this guy over here. Also, the HD base T extenders that are HD base T uh, that I'm sorry that are um, that are uh, that are 18 gig with ICT. Uh, what you want to look for in those is a 444 in the model number. So there's there's three different options. There's a 40 meter 444, a 70 meter 444, and a 100 meter 444. And a lot of these guys too will have uh, uh, built-in EDID management, audio extraction. You know, we wanted to build a robust product for you guys, not just an extender, but something that did quite a bit more too. We also have in the bottom right corner here uh, is our SC1 scaler. Uh, this one does have invisible compression technology built into it because there's a trick that I'll show you in the next few slides where you can take two SC1s and you can preserve an 18 gig signal even though the infrastructure in the home might be old or maybe they're using an old switch or something like that. 
So the SC1 scaler will have the ICT technology built in also. Um, here are the full model numbers of the HD base T matrix switches. There's an AC MX44 AUHD HD base T. Uh, really quick, just so you guys have an idea of how to kind of decode our model numbers. When you see MX, that's a matrix switch. When you see 44, that's a in, four input, four output. AUHD means it's 18 gigs, and HD base T means that it supports HD base T. So that comes in a four by four. That also comes in an eight by eight. And then we have what I mentioned before and teased before was the 16 by 16. Um, that's going to be also an HD base T product as well. I do believe that we do also have a two by 10, if I'm not mistaken, that's HD base T. But uh, these are uh, these are just some of the common ones. Uh, the four by four and the eight by eight are very very popular. And uh, for people who need more inputs and more outputs, we do have that 16 by 16 coming. Um, it, it's it's a it's a really impressive looking product. It's it's big. It's got a metal body. It's two rack units. Uh, it's it's a really cool looking piece. Uh, we should see that Q1. I don't have any exact dates on that yet, but uh, for you guys who are doing really big systems and need a lot of inputs and a lot of outputs, we do have that 16 by 16 coming. This is a connection diagram on a very common system that we, we run into with the integrators all the time. Um, you have a situation where you've got multiple 4K sources, multiple 4K displays. Again, I'll mention this again, maybe two displays are 1080p, you do have a scaler built into the switch. So you can scale down to 1080p for a display or two if you need to. Our matrix switch is fully controllable by uh, AV Pro Canvas, which is our own proprietary control system. But we also wanted to be versatile enough for you guys. So uh, if you use Control 4, if you use RTI or Savant or Crestron, we do have drivers built already for those. They're available on our website. You could always give us a call at tech support. We can email those to you as well. Um, some of these outputs are HD base T, so you might have category cable over to a receiver. Some of these are straight HDMI. You know, maybe in this particular situation, maybe this 4K display is a really nice projector in a theater room and the client didn't want any compression at all, or, or we want to get very, very, very good clean signal to that TV, then that's great. We'll go HDMI for that one if we want to. But the great thing about the HD base T switch is your outputs can be either category cable or HDMI. It doesn't matter. So if you are going to use HD base T, instead of buying a, a uh, extender kit with a receiver and a transmitter, if you're using an HD base T based uh, matrix switch, then all you have to do is buy the receiver part of the extender. So it saves you a couple bucks and uh, keeps your installation a little bit cleaner too. Another feature that I like about these is we have audio extraction. So let's say that uh, throughout the home, you also had a audio distributed system. Maybe there's speakers throughout the home and out on the back patio and in the hallways and bathrooms and things like that. You can pull the audio straight from the matrix switch with toss link or even go analog and plug into your audio amplifier or your audio distribution system. So it's a very robust switch. It does quite a bit. Uh, you can control it with just about anything you want. And uh, this is one of the products that does have a 10 year warranty like uh, most of our extenders and, and matrix switches do. But again, I just wanted you guys to see a snapshot of something that we deal with on a day to day basis. Now, maybe for the video files of the world, and maybe for somebody like me who in my house, the distances wouldn't have to be that long and I'm really particular about the video, we can do this fully uncompressed. Uh, if you look at the matrix switches that do not have HD base T in the model number, those are all gonna be normal HDMI switching devices. And those are all full 18 gigs uncompressed and support every single flavor of HDR. Uh, we do that in a 16 by 16 already, and, and we somehow managed to engineer this thing so it's only one rack unit, which, which is very impressive. I would have thought that would have been a lot bigger. Um, there's an eight by eight matrix switch as well. There's also a four by four matrix switch. Just remember uh, what I mentioned before about the model numbers. If you wanna be sure that it's fully 18 gigs, just make sure that it has AUHD in the model number. So this would be like an AC MX 88 AUHD. This would be like an AC MX 44 AUHD. So as long as there's AUHD in the model number, then you know that you're good on the 18 gigs. This is our current fiber extender, the EXO 444. Um, this is a little weird. It was our very first fiber extender. Even though it is fiber, we still have to compress the signal a little bit, but there is a fiber extender coming that is fully uncompressed. Uh, today, this is what we have uh, that we have in stock and that and that we're shipping. So this is still an 18 gig uh, extender. It does use ICT, so you can't see the compression, and it supports all flavors of HDR. 
Now, depending on what kind of fiber that you've ran and, and what you need, you can use either single mode fiber for really long distances, or you can go with multi-mode fiber for what I'll call normal distances. Uh, even with multi-mode fiber, you can still go as long as 300 meters, which is super, super long. But again, we'll use that example before of the high school football stadium. If you need to go you know, 1,000 meters or even 2,000 meters, um, you'd want to use single mode fiber and, and you could still use this EXO444 kit. Other than just extending the signal, this also supports ARC. Uh, that becomes very important when um, you have somebody who wants to stream Netflix and Amazon Prime, for example, like from the TV itself. Um, having the ARC built into the extender will, will ensure that you get the audio back to the audio system. Also built-in test patterns. So if you're trying to troubleshoot some infrastructure or maybe you're trying to see if a display can handle 18 gigs, uh, we do have built-in test patterns into the, uh, into the uh, kit as well. Also built-in EDID management, which becomes very important. Sometimes we have EDIDs in the TV that are not quite right and maybe there's something with the EDID that's broken and it's not asking for HDR from the source or you know, we run into these weird little EDID problems all the time. So knowing that, if, if we give you the ability to control the EDID from the extender itself, if you do have a TV with a, with a weird EDID, then you can do all your EDID uh, management at the extender and that saves a lot of headaches. Uh, just below that, we have the normal copper-based HD base T extenders. Uh, on these, you want to look for 444 in the model number. Um, that will ensure that you're using, uh, that you're getting the full 18 gigs with HDR. So you'll see like a 40 meter 444, 70 meter 444, and then we have the 100 meter 444. Again, full HDR support. Um, what I do like about the 70 meter and the 100 meter, uh, they also add Ethernet support. So for guys who are gaming, uh, this is really important. Um, you know, gamers are always looking for the ultimate speeds and, and things like that. And um, maybe they're in a room on the other side of the house and their Wi-Fi in that room isn't very good and uh, their game isn't performing that well. Uh, what you can do with the 70 and the 100 meter um, transmitter and receiver kit is they do support Ethernet. So on one end of the house, you could plug the transmitter into the router. On the other end of the house, you can plug your Xbox or your PlayStation or your TV or whatever you want to be hardwired to the network into the uh, into the receiver. Uh, so I really like that feature a lot. My house uh, in Florida is is pretty difficult because it's solid concrete. Uh, so, so I like to hardwire my um, my laptop to the Ethernet port. And then you also have people too that are worried about security. I mean, we all know that Ethernet is is more more secure than Wi-Fi. So if that's the case, even if it's not a performance issue, you, you can still take advantage of that Ethernet support. On the 100 meter, you also have a USB extension and ARC support. The USB extension is pretty cool. You can pop in a thumb drive and, and maybe watch some videos you have stored or something like that. But you can also make it more functional too. So maybe you have a dedicated home theater PC and it's in a rack, but you want to be able to control it with a keyboard and a mouse from your couch. Uh, and, and you'll be able to do that with, with the extender kits, uh, with, the, with the 100 meter. Cool feature. Also built-in test patterns, just like the other model, uh, the fiber extender. Also EDID management. And one thing that we did add to, uh, to the, uh, ex the 444 extender series is built-in scaling. Because again, maybe the client has a 1080p TV now, but they're going to get a 4K TV later. But you're already building out the infrastructure. Um, you can go ahead and get a 444 extender kit for that, for that room or that TV downscale it to 1080p, and then when they do get the 4K display, you can turn off the scaling and watch it in 4K and it's full glory. Okay, moving on. Okay, this is a brand new product. This is the uncompressed fiber extender, uh, whereas the EXO kit that we looked at before, the EXO444, even though that is fiber, uh, we, we had to use some compression, uh, but this brand new product, this is gonna be a completely uncompressed uh, fiber, optic, uh, fiber optic extender. Uh, somebody like me who's really into video and really into into uh, calibration and, and picture quality and things like that. Uh, I want to eliminate any possibilities of, of any artifacting and things like that. I'm going to go with probably an uncompressed solution like this. So again, uh, uh, this is an EXO UNC kit. The UNC is un, kind of a shortened version, a uh, shortened form of uncompressed. Um, that's a full 18 gigs, of course, uncompressed. 4K 6444, 10 and 12 bit HDR, every single flavor, including Dolby Vision. It does have a downscaler built in, 4K to 1080p, just in case. Uh, you also have EDID management built in with a, a handful of built in preset EDIDs. What you can also do with this product is take an, a known good EDID out of, say, a TV that you know has a good EDID 
you can copy that into uh, into the uh, EXO kit, and you can use the the good EDID from that TV. And this happens a lot, guys. Um, we we have our, our training room that has you know 30 TVs in it, and um, some of them are older, some of them are newer. Um, but we want at the end of the day, we want the source to uh, to output um, uh, 4K HDR because it's a 4K HDR player. So what we might do in this situation is take the EDID from one of the TVs that's 4K and HDR. We know the EDID is good, and we'll put that EDID into the extender kit, and that way we can use a, a one known good EDID. But again, also uh, they do have some built-in EDIDs as well, some some presets. This is one of my favorite products we sell. It's so simple. It's so it it, it does such a great job at so many different things. Uh, this is the SC1 uh, Universal Scaler. Also has built-in EDID management. Uh, one of the biggest benefits of this product is it's very very tight on the HDMI equalization coming out of it. So sometimes you'll see a product. Uh, it, it, there's really no rhyme or reason to it. It could be a really expensive product. It could be an inexpensive product. But a lot of times it'll have a hard time locking onto the signal. And a lot of that is due to bad or, or sloppy HDMI equalization. So if you have situations like that, you can actually use this SC1 scaler just for the HDMI equalization. So I had a situation one time with a, with a high-end Blu-ray player. It was having a hard time uh, communicating with the projector that it was hooked up to. So from the HDMI output of the Blu-ray player, I plugged it into the HDMI input of this scaler. The output of the scaler continued on down the signal chain and, and went, eventually went to the projector. And even though we weren't using any of the scaling or EDID management or anything like that on the scaler itself, because it was just there and plugged in, it cleaned up the HDMI equalization quite a bit and the, the projector would lock on way more consistently. It does a really, really good job with stuff like that. There also is an SC2 scaler that's a brand new product. Uh, the SC1, um, it, it's great at so many things, but it's only going to let us scale from 2K or 1080p to 4K and back as well. So you can go 2K to 4K or 4K to 2K. The SC2 takes it a step further. The SC2 will let uh, will let you scale the signal all the way down to 480 or all the way up to 4K, and it can deinterlace and interlace as well. So when you have these difficult cable boxes and direct TV boxes perhaps, or, or any satellite box for that matter, that are primarily 1080i, um, we know how difficult it is for 1080i in, in a high bandwidth system. It doesn't make any sense, and, and 1080i is something that's probably gonna go away one day, but uh, because of the way it's structured, it, it's kind of, a, kind of a hard thing to move around. P is much easier. So if you use the SC2, you can just simply plug it in the SC2 has something in it called adaptive scaling mode. So when it sees an I signal coming into it, it just automatically converts it to 1080p and the output's always gonna be 1080p. So if you're dealing with a difficult cable box or something like that, the SC2 is a great little product. But again, that can go all the way down to 480 and all the way back up to 4K. Now I teached you guys before about older infrastructure and using two SC1s to preserve the 18 gigs. So here, here's my, here's the situation you might be in. Let's say you got a brand new 4K source with 18 gigs, and you got a brand new TV over here that's 4K HDR, but you have old infrastructure in the home, maybe old HDMI cables, maybe an old matrix switch or something like that, or HDMI uh, splitter. Maybe you've got an old HD base T extender. That's okay. This we can deal with. The idea here is you take a HDMI cable, you go from the output of the 4K source to the input of the scaler, the output of the scaler continues down, eventually it hits the second scaler, this scaler decompresses what this scaler compressed, and then coming out of this is gonna be your full 18 gigs with HDR again. So a lot of times you run into situations that are pretty difficult because you can't rewire the home, you don't wanna rewire the home, uh, maybe it's not in the budget, but you have this one situation here where you got a 4K source and a 4K TV. You can still do it. It's not a big deal. And that's just by using two SC1s. Pretty cool little trick. And again, because of the ICT, the invisible compression technology, zero worries on ruining the picture. We do have a few full bandwidth solutions as far as cables go. Um, we have the bullet train cables, as we mentioned before. They come in two flavors. You have long haul and short haul. The long haul cables go all the way as, as long as 40 meters. And because the TMDS channels are fiber, um, you know, the 40 meters is okay. Um, and the short haul version of the bullet train cables 
Uh, those are as short as I believe half a meter, uh, if I'm not mistaken, half a meter, maybe one meter. Uh, so you can get those fiber AOC cables in just about any length you want to. Also, we have 18 gig standard HDMI cables that are passive copper, like some stuff we've been used to for, for years now. Uh, we have those as high as 15 meters. Uh, so if you want to go fully uncompressed 18 gigs, we have plenty of cable solutions for you as well. Now we talked earlier about HD base T and extenders and high bandwidth and extra processing and more heat. Um, I've seen racks before where somebody stacked up a few extenders and maybe there's some cables bundled up right there. Maybe the rack is in a closet with the door closed and there's no ventilation. You know, we've got to be really careful here with heat because heat is one of the number one killers of electronics. So one of the things that we built for you guys to, to help with thermal management is this, uh, is this rack solution. So what you can do here is you can take eight, up to eight, at least with one of these pieces, you can take up to eight transmitters or receivers. You can space them out in your rack. You can give them proper ventilation. Um, that also gives you space to properly dress the cable so you have a nice looking rack. Um, also on the right side of the screen here, you'll see what we have uh, a product called a power squid. And this is just an attempt to keep your cables orderly and to keep the rack looking nice. So instead of having eight different power supplies for eight different extenders, this is one power supply with eight different um, connectors on it. So this also helps too with wire management, uh, makes the rack look nicer. It's less wires in the rack, so that helps with heat. So just a couple things to point out uh, when it comes to, to managing your heat. Uh, you know, of course, we all would love to have our racks in a climate controlled room with ventilation and things like that, but it's not always the case. Sometimes you are stuck putting the rack in the closet or in the basement or where you don't have ventilation or a fan or something like that. But these things will help in those situations. Troubleshooting 4K, that can be a little tricky. It's not like tro troubleshooting 1080p. There's just a lot more you have to know with 4K. Like for example, maybe you're not getting Dolby Vision, but you're getting HDR and you have to figure out why. And these were non-issues with 1080p. So we do have to know a little bit more about the system. We do have to understand it a little bit better when we try to troubleshoot. Um, one of the number one things we saw in a CEDIA survey uh, was that um, integrators, uh, it was something like 62% of troubleshooting jobs had something to do with HDMI uh, and, and 4K. So being able to troubleshoot this stuff is really important. Um, we need to make sure that we're dealing with uh, sources that we know are good 18 gigs. Um, most of our mainstream products now, this is a non-issue, but we still sometimes will see some kind of off-brand or, or knockoff products that, that don't handle 18 gigs well at all. Same thing with the HDR um, uh, 4K display. Uh, again, same, similar situation as the sources. Most of our mainstream stuff has no problem with this these days. Every once in a while, you will run into it, though. You have to be able to manage the EDID, especially in a mixed system of 4K and 2K. You have to be able to test your cables, guys. Uh, one of my biggest pieces of advice right now to integrators is before you go to the client's home or to the job site, test your HDMI cables. I'd rather find out at the shop where I can swap it out really quick versus finding it out once it's already been buried inside the wall. So test your cables before you install them. And you also need to be able to test HTCP 2.2 as well, which our, our generators and our, our kits actually do. Here's an example of one of the troubleshooting kits that we have. This is very common with integrators. This is the Fox and the Hound, uh, excuse me, the Fox and the Hound HDMI troubleshooting kit. It's two pieces, a generator and an analyzer. It comes in this really nice uh, hard shell case with the foam inserts, it packs away really well. Um, this product has a three-year warranty. Um, I love the way it's set up. It's small enough to hold in your hands. Um, a great example of when you'd want to use this is maybe you're dealing with a rack in the basement and you're having a hard time with the TV upstairs in the living room. Well, instead of trying something at the rack and then running upstairs and looking at the picture to see if it showed up or not, you can take this analyzer and plug it into the output of the rack and you can see exactly what should be on the screen at the time. So if I plug the generator into the rack and I hook up the analyzer out of the rack on the output of the rack, what I put into it should be coming out. So instead of running upstairs and looking at the TV up there, I can just look on this little screen here and see exactly what's going on. I can also send test patterns through to test the infrastructure to see if it can handle 4K, for example. Um, I can also do my um, EDID management here as well. I can read EDIDs and things like that as well. So this is a very, very good little kit. Um, for, for integrators who are doing doing a lot of installs and, and a lot of troubleshooting and things like that. We also do have the the, uh, the Fresco kit, which is the 6A and 6G. Uh, that's used quite a bit with, with calibration type stuff, but uh, one thing I do like about the 6A and 6G is that it, it can do a little bit more and you can find out a little bit more about what's going on than you can with the Fox and the Hound. But they're both great tools. Uh, usually my advice is if you're not calibrating, the Fox and the Hound will, will take care of most things for you. If you are calibrating, then you need to get into the 6G 
and uh, you can always uh, you can always attach the 6A to it if you are going to be doing some calibrating and troubleshooting. So moving into the future, uh, what are we going to be seeing soon? Uh, 5K is going to be a popular resolution. Again, I think it's going to be mostly in video games and maybe even for VR. I have done some VR demos in the past, and you can really tell if it's low res. You can see pixels because the screen's so close to your face. Uh, that's kind of distracting and takes away from the experience, so we need higher res there. Uh, we've already seen some 8K film. Uh, stuff that was filmed on film in 70 millimeter years ago, uh, that's going to have the capability to be remastered in digital at 8K at some point. So we're looking forward to some of that stuff. Uh, also, uh, also for VR, we might see 10K. We might see 10. K we might see 10K in film. I don't quite know yet. If it, if, it, if we did, it would be probably a pretty cool wide aspect ratio. But it's coming. The 10K is built into the spec. Um, now 120 frames per second. Because the frame rate does take up a lot of space, uh, we uh, we have a feeling that 4K 120 is going to be a very popular um, format for things like sports, uh, live events, and, and again, video gaming and things like that. We did see some 8K stuff at CES. We saw some um, stuff from Sony and Samsung and LG and, and most of the big manufacturers. Uh, the Samsung 8K display, the QLED, is already shipping, so that's already out there in the wild. I've already calibrated one of them. Um, uh, next we have to worry about the content. You know, we dealt with this with 4k, you know, the big thing about 4k was, oh, great. We have 4k displays, but no 4k content. And now when you look at the 4k content, it's everywhere. So we'll probably be dealing with the same thing with 8k. The displays will come first and then we'll get the content. Um, there are some computer graphics cards that are 8k right now, but, um, it's all very high end and, and, uh, pretty pricey stuff, but it, it'll eventually will trickle down to, to video products. Uh, I'm thinking in the next two years, this is going to be very common. We're going to start seeing it uh, this year for sure. But regardless of how long it takes to get to 8K and to get to HDMI 2.1, guys, I mean, we're here for you. Th this is what we do. This is what we love. We love helping you guys. We love being here for you. And uh, we've got plenty of plans for products that, that can handle this high bandwidth stuff. I mentioned before the Meridio 7G, which is going to be um, going to be our, our newest generator. We did have it at Cedia last year and showed it off a little bit. Uh, it's still going through some testing right now and some beta testing, so it's not quite ready for for prime time, but it will be soon. Um, now, because of the chipset, um, the, the the cost of the chipset and and how rare they are right now, the uh, the new uh, 7G generator is actually going to be HDMI 2.0 out of the box. But what we did was we made the HDMI board removable in in, a, in a, like a card form. So when the 7G comes out. Initially, it's going to be HDMI 2.0, 18 gigs, but eventually you'll be able to buy an HDMI 2.1, 48 gig card. You slide the old card out, you slap the new card in, and now your 7G is 48 gigs, uh, HDMI 2.1. So uh, we, we've already looked into this stuff. Uh, we've already made plans for the future to be able to support this stuff for you guys and help you with it. And we were going to continue continue doing that as long as we exist as a company. Um, for more information on some of the products that you may have seen today during the presentation, you can always visit us at avproedge.com. You can always give us a call, of course, too. Uh, meridio.com has some useful information. Uh, if you guys are, are integrators and you haven't been on some of our forums, there are some tech tips, and um, I've, I've um, posted a lot of calibration stuff on the Meridio forum, so feel free to check that stuff out and feel free to comment and contribute. Um, for more training uh, type things like uh, AV Pro Academy, which which we just finished our first class, it went really well. It's a two-day course on most of the stuff that we talked about today, and we dive deep into it, do a lot of hands-on activities. So we have the AV Pro Academy. We also support the ISF classes for calibration. We also support the HAA classes for audio calibration. So for any information on when we hold those classes and dates and things like that, what to expect, feel free to give us a shout at avpro.training. Or again, like I said before, you can always give us a call. So that's it for the presentation, guys. Thank you so much for, for sitting through with me and, and learning about this stuff. Um, it looks like that um, it looks like Tom was able to answer a lot of questions throughout the presentation. Um, I'm going to scroll through them quickly here and see if there are any that he wasn't able to answer. If um, if you guys have any specific questions for me that maybe we didn't even talk about today, that's okay. You guys are always, always, always welcome to um, to uh, email me at jason at avproglobal.com.